स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Welcome to the final lecture in our study of kinship and family in India. This lecture will look at the idea of multi-species kinship or kinship and kinning with non-humans. It's a complicated idea, something that we may not have thought of, but something that marks our interaction and our process of being at the everyday level. While we look at the idea of kinning with animals and non-humans, maybe robots and cyborgs or aliens itself, we are beginning to go into a new era of kinship studies where the idea of biology and culture itself is being desiccated. Thus, the initial difference between nature and culture now is up for newer imagining and critique. We do not speak of nature in opposition to culture, but we speak of what Donna Haraway speaks of in the sense of the nature culture one word, nature, culture. Nature cultures are spaces where we do not differentiate between the idea of what forms biology or what culture makes of biology. Instead, we are looking at what is available from our, from our vast resources of everyday experience to think of kin, kinship and our sense of relatedness. Here, Janet Kasten is becoming a very important node of analysis. Kasten's idea that we have discussed in a previous lecture on relatedness is now becoming our most important tool to think of how we can imagine our contemporary nodes of relationships and meaning. Here, our interpersonal relationships are not only those marked by particular codes and symbols, but those that we ourselves define. Thus, anthropology is now opening up its doors to new ideas and new modes and tools of analysis. Within such an analysis, the first thinker who really developed the idea of looking at multi-species kinship without really knowing that she was doing so was the anthropologist Marilyn Strathon. In her seminal volume on English kinship, she looks at how nature is played out through the twin obsessions that the English have in pets and gardens. In many ways, nature and the cultural conquest of nature is mediated through the domestication of pets and through the obsession of trimmed beautiful gardens that the English had. This sense is also a very important way to think of how dogs, cats and other animals become an important part of the human lexicon of social life. We think of our animal friends as our kin in an important sense that we do not give much regard when thinking of our kinship networks. In looking through multi-species kinship, one is actually asking you to think of relatedness with people who are not human and they may be actually people as well. Thus, the conceptualization of the non-human is not restricted to animals alone, but may be largely an all encompassing to look at how we think of how we live our daily lives. Most importantly, the focus on multi-species kinship aims to include the non-human in the idea of kinship. Thus, in one of the books that we will do in this course by Radhika Govindarajan, she deliberately attempts to look at how animals think. She imagines that animals too have agency and may want to conceptualize their sense of self as well. In that sense, the difference between biology and culture, wild and domestic or animal and non-human, uh, I apologize, human and animal becomes absolutely irrelevant. We are now moving towards a point where we think of kinship and kinning as so encompassing that we can make kin of everyone. This is exactly what Donna Haraway says in her latest book on kinship saying that you should not make babies, but you should make kin. In an attempt to save a planet which is fast depleting and dying on us, Donna Haraway suggests that we should now aim to bring 
kinship and become kin with all those who inhabit our world space. This means actively engaging with our lived environment rather than destroying it. Here she is asking us to make kinship with trees, animals, germs, bacteria that form our lived selves. In our attempt to destroy and overcome and overpark nature, we have become a domineering culture that does not think of all those who inhabit the planet. Kinship may have an answer to curtailing the way in which the earth and the environment is headed towards disaster. Making kin according to Donna Haraway is an important way in which we will take others seriously. Because ties of blood and marriage remain the only serious nodes of our understanding of ourselves, Haraway, Strathern, Radhika, Govindarajan and others suggest that we must move towards an attempt to look at others also who become part of this lexicon of belonging. Thus, interestingly, in Strathern's work on British kinship, nature is mediated through our control of it. However, nature also overpowers and overcomes us. Thus, thinking of nat nature cultures, Strathern suggests partial connections. She says that oppositions of nature and culture do not always work in the way we think they should, but actually are connected to us through the sense of the partia partial connection of our bodies and selves that we share with others. If you see in the idea of the partial connection, the resonance of sharing and of shared bodies and substances again comes up. Thus, relatedness marks the way in which we think about our close kin and kinship. Relationships are not just marked in stone and in oppositions, but form an essential way in which we mark our fluid sense of self. In that sense, the West itself is reconfiguring its idea of individuality. To be part of a community and to invest in the communal nature of living means to let go of a sense of individuality that is both harmful and destructive. To be part of a community of a social whole also means to look beyond humans and to encompass those who we share the environment and our surroundings with. This is also essential in the way in which we think of ourselves and of our communities in a more uh, dynamic and fertile way. Thus, in Donna Haraway's companion manifesto, she talks about the intimate relation that humans share with dogs as a starting point to think of kinship with multi-species. Dogs remain the most important aspect of human navigation with their own sense of self. Dogs as they, imag as they are imagined in human relationships and as they truly are, become an important way in which to think of how kinship can be reframed. Donna Haraway speaks of dogs and their role as companion species within human history through different trajectories of historical interventions. Most importantly, she suggests that the companion species is not something that is a pre-given, but something that is dependent on the act of doing itself. Thus, a dog is your relative through the act of companionship that the human and the dog build. This is a revolutionary idea in itself, something that many people may scoff at. Can animals really be relatives of humans? Many might find it an idea which is both laughable and, and something that cannot be part of our daily lexicon. But in even thinking about such an intervention within the anthropology of kinship means we are going towards newer conceptualizations of how we can think of kinship itself. Now we are not to be pushed back or marked through strict models of marriage and blood, but some, uh, but open up our floodgates for newer engagement with different species and categories of persons, people, non-humans and cyborgs. Donna Haraway's book on the companion species is interestingly juxtaposed with the idea of the cyborg. In her, in her manifesto for cyborgs, she discusses how half-human, half-robotic beings can actually be our akin. However, unlike companion species, cyborgs are intelligent and may overcome the human race itself. The fear of the cyborgian control and invasion continues to mark our thought in terms of how we think about artificial intelligence and robots. However, the fear of the other also marks the way in which we engage with the most uh, with our pets and animals who inhabit our surroundings. 
Thus, companion species uh, occupy a space which is more fluid and comfortable. Here, the dog itself is a being that is so independent and yet embedded in our psychology, in our psychology of how human relationships are mapped. We desire the relationship we have with our pet dog to be transposed onto the relationship that we have with fellow humans. This is interesting as Donna Haraway speaks of how the romanticism associated with the idea of the unconditional love that your pet dog has for you is both debilitating and an injustice that we do to our companion species. The idea of unconditional love is something that Haraway finds humans resort to in the, in the absence of true human love or, or relationships. Humans transpose the frustrations they feel through shared human love and relationship onto something that they have with their companion species. Dogs are supposed to render their relationships with us through the sense of deep abiding love and loyalty which is never questioned despite the kind of treatment that might be meted out to them. The notion of the unconditional love therefore comes to mark dogs in social discourse as children like, almost similar to what Strathern finds amongst the British in their conceptualization of pets as akin to their children. In this sense, Donna Haraway finds that companion species are rendered into uh, kin by making them into biological childlike notions of petting and upbringing. This form of biosociality that we have discussed before in an earlier lecture makes for very deep unhappiness. Biosociality as a concept links uh, people through the idiom of biology. In an earlier lecture where I discussed the medicalization of kin, biosociality seems to mark out uh, relations based on the shared, sharing of technology and medical expertise. Thus, interestingly, when organ donors give their organs to recipients, the relationship formed with a diseased donor and a surviving recipient becomes a mode of biosociality. It is navigated by the transference of that particular organ. Within the understanding of multi-species kinship, biosociality becomes also very important in looking at how we think of our other companion species. Dogs, cats, horses, birds, fishes all become part of our understanding of domestication and petting. However, according to Donna Haraway, when biosociality comes to be marked by this particular idea of unconditional love, we again impose certain rules of kinship and affection onto the idea of how we should relate to our multi-species. The notion that Haraway is pushing for is to look at multi-species kinship through the eyes of the species that we wish to kin with to not impose pre-given ideas of human kinship upon newer forms of relationship that may, we may be trying to develop on. Thus, our relationship with our pets has to follow a fluid mandate and not one that is predefined by our social uh, desires of love and kinship. In that sense, breeders of prized dogs understand that unconditional love is a mirage and something that humans forcibly uh, impo impose on their companion species. Moving away from such forced renditions of biosociality, where again cultures and pre-given ideas of nature impose themselves on particular humans and their everyday interaction becomes an essential mode to rethink kinship once again. We are heading towards a new era where we seek kin amongst our lived relations and not through particular codes of understanding and framing. We are moving towards an era where as Haraway continuously exhorts us, we need to make kin and not babies. In that sense, we are looking also at an earth and an environment where increasingly we have to think of relatedness on multiple levels of engagement. In that sense, companion species offers us new modes of thinking through how we can think of those we are close to. In the context of India, this form of kinship is most potent when seen in relation to Anu Jale's interesting study of the Sundarvans. Anu Jale's study is very in 
very, very potent in thinking of how we constantly live with others who are kin to us, but not traditionally marked by kinship. Jale's study of the Sundarbans makes for an interesting reading of how the forest marks uh, the lived realities of the people who live close to it. Thus, the tiger in the Sundarbans is kin in the shared space and shared food that the forest gives. Anu Jales talks of the myth of the bone bibi who is worshipped by the locals to protect them from the wrath of the tiger and of the vicissitudes of the forest. The bone bibi or the forest goddess is a particular rendition of how the forest becomes animated by its own personality. The story of bone bibi is particularly interesting in thinking of kinship in its various multi-species form. Jalez mentions how bone bibi comes to be part of a very interesting myth where she is abandoned by her parents in a forest and brought up by a deer as a surrogate mother. The deer supports the young girl through, to, through her childhood and finally the child is con called upon by Allah to protect the forest from the vicious attack of Tokkin Rai who is the tiger human demon. This myth then comes to mark Sundarban residents engagement with the forest. It is important to understand that nobody is good or bad within such a setting. Everybody must live in a precarious and harsh environment where everyday survival is of utmost importance. To be able to survive and thrive in such a setting means to respect each other's rights to land, environment and forest commons. One of the reasons why Bone Baby is worshipped in the Sundarbans is because she gives the right to the forest to all dwellers. She does not choose or pick anyone or anyone else, but provides both the tiger and the human with rights to the forest. The Bone Baby is considered mother to both humans and tigers and all the other beings who inhabit the Sundarbans. This particular rendition of Sundarban eco-activism and survival makes Anu Jale's work very, very interesting in mapping how we think of multi-species kinship and our idea of relatedness. Thus, in the Sundarbans, tigers and humans share the same produce from the forest. They eat the same animals, the same fish and live on the same land. This makes them kin in very interesting ways. Jale suggests that the conceptualization of relatedness that Karsten discusses can be used to understand how the Sundarbanians think of their relationship with the forest. Thus, a man and woman, a Sundarban man and woman is brother or sister to the tiger. They eat and produce from the same resources and therefore must respect each other. This respect means that the role of what Anu Jalez identifies as the tiger charmers becomes a very important node to think of Sundarban living. Here, uh, sustainability and kinship go hand in hand. Thus, sharing in the produce of the forest is very important also in relation to how we think of the environment that these people share in. The harsh environment of the Sundarbans is something that marks shared relationships as well. Both the tiger and the humans navigate the precarity of the Sundarban ecosystem and they both contribute to it. Thus, relatedness is inevitable. This is seen in the role, as I mentioned earlier, of the tiger charmer who mediates between humans and tigers in very effective ways. No particular trip to the Sundarbans, especially dangerous trips to collect honey or wood, can be complete without the support of the tiger charmer. The tiger charmer has become so only through dreams of bone bibi. It is a calling and not something that a person chooses to be. A calling to be a tiger charmer means to respect the forest and its produce and most importantly to worship Bone Bibi and the tiger who occupies the forest. There are certain rules that Anu Jalez identifies all tiger charmers must follow to make up for the fruitful interaction between humans and non-humans. One of the things that the tiger charmer should be is be extremely humble and peaceful. He should never proclaim to the world that he's a tiger charmer. It is a role that is bestowed upon him and not something that he has demanded or chosen. This respect comes from the respect of the forest commons. The forest is like a home 
just like we inhabit homes. This idea of the shared home and hearth therefore becomes very important in navigating the produce of the forest. The tiger charmer must always respect the forest before going in, paying it due obeisance, respect and prayer. Alongside, the tiger charmer must follow certain pre-given Islamic precepts such as not going to the forest on a Friday, worship the forest floor before entering it, not eat pork or crabs which are not allowed as per Islamic practices. The tiger charmer must respect these rules in respect of Mon Bibi. Interestingly, in respecting these ritualistic codes, the tiger charmer must also protect those he takes to the forest floor. Harmful and risky travel such as those including honey and uh, wood cutting involve precarious negotiations with the Sundarban forest floor. Before entering the forest, the tiger charmer must touch uh, the forest floor with his hand and check the earth. Checking the earth is an important practice to understand how the tiger feels. These may seem ritualistic superstitious practices, but for the Sundarban dwellers, these are important negotiations that they deal with in thinking of the forest and its inhabitants as their kin. Thus, any trip that leads to the tiger charmer's uh, hesitance in entering the forest is immediately cancelled. The forest entry too is marked with particular temporal rules. The tiger charmer and his group must not enter when animals are feeding. Thus, early morning and late evening when animals rest are good times to enter the forest. It is important that the forest not be disturbed at night for animals are awake and about. These ideas mark our notion of how the forest is a lived being as well. We refuse to therefore ac accept that nature is always under the control and overbearing uh, uh, destruction of culture. Here nature is more important than culture and it must be protected for what it is. This negotiation with the forest and its uh, variety of products means that inherently communities residing near the forest must learn to respect their ecological environment. Not only the Sundarban dwellers but also tribals have constantly protected the forest they have inhabited. In India, Adivasi culture demands that you take from the forest only that which you can uh, survive on. Anything in excess is to create animosity with the, most, with the closest kin you have, the forest and its inhabitants. Thus, Ecological movements in India go, are going back to basic principles that Adivasi communities and forest dwelling communities have always practiced, respecting your environment. In the ideology of ecofeminism, the idea of going back and returning to the nature is essential. Here ecofeminism suggests that women are the closest to the forest as they live off forest produce. Their links to the forest make it important for women to nurture them. Men on the other hand uh, occupy the space of culture where they actually destroy and inhabit forests in a cruel and unnecessary way. In the Sundarbans, this idea of the forest is continuously resurrected in, under, in, in taking and partaking of its produce in an equitable way. Thus, if you, if you go fishing and take crabs and prawns from the rivers of the Sundarbans, you must sell only that which you can afford to sell. Anything in excess sold for profit is taking unnecessary claims from the forest. The worship of Bone Bibi presumes that you will take from the forest only that which you can survive on. Anu Jales finds an interesting practice amongst the Sundarbanians where they sell produce from the forest and do not demand immediate payment. She finds a kind of generalized reciprocity uh, earlier discussed by Marshall Salins in the study of kinship to look at how payment for produce from the forest and the rivers nearby is mediated through particular modes of being. Thus, you will never demand immediate payment but ask for it at a later time through the practice of begging. 
This is peculiar as the tiger charmer and others who enter the forest floor must also enter the sundarbans with a, mom with, with a stance of supplication. They must beg the bone bibi to let them enter the forest so that they may survive. Taking from the forest in contravention of survival means taking for profit and this is not allowed or accepted. In that sense, and a sense of obligation and reciprocity exists among, amongst those who live in the Sundarbans. This also means that multi-species kinship aims to make egalitarian exchange a part of our understanding of what we think of ourselves and those who live alongside us. The hierarchical exchange that marks marriage exchange or cross-cousin marriage is not part of this conversation at all. Here we are all equals and we must take as per what is due to us. In the analysis of the Sundarbans, the economic rationality that Anu Jalez finds is followed amongst the people here marks the way in which they must constantly think of sharing resources and not taking what is not theirs. This is an important ideology to constantly come back to, to think of ourselves and our negotiation with our environment. In that sense, uh, when Jale speaks of fictive kinship, kinship amongst the Sundarbanians, she also talks of how certain people come together through this act of sharing. Thus, the salty air that marks the Sundarbans and its inhabitants creates distress and animosity, but also creates avenues of relationship. Because all those who live there, including humans and non-humans, share in the same sense of distress and strife and difficult uh, negotiations with the environment, they all come together in a notion of fictive kinship. Such fictive kinship is often formalized through particular rituals akin to what is practiced in Bengal, which is called dharma atyota or the relationship based on spirituality or religion. Here, the relationship built through particular rituals is important to link people in, in ways that are more important than, the thought, than uh, things which we relate to blood. Thus, beyond blood, our understanding of particular notions of being become essential. Here, salt water or the saline air that inhabits the Sundarbans is an important mode of thinking through our kinship and kinning. As we go into studying further about multi-species kinship, we must imagine how we think of ourselves in relation to particular animals and pets. It is to this idea that we must come back to again and again when we conceptualize kinship. As we go into the next uh, book, Radhika Govindarajan speaks of how multi-species kinship is here to stay. Her conceptualization of multi-species kinship is particularly ev emotive and potent in thinking of how animals themselves have a sense of agency and rationality. We should never forget that animals too inhabit multiple spaces and have a particular mode of being that humans may not necessarily understand or seek to understand. Radhika Govindarajan studies multi-species kinship in uh, the hill town of Mukteshwar. Here, she looks at how different animals come to mark their relationship with humans and vice versa. In her notion of multi-species kinship, she again draws from uh, Janet Kasten's idea of relatedness to think of how humans and non-humans are entangled in a web of relations. These entanglements are not so simple and must be wrought and thought through different, a, different modes of being. Thus, multi-species relatedness emerges from an idea of difference and similarity, which is critical to how we think of kinship. Ideally, we have been speaking of kinship and family through a mode where, this, where similar people and similar ideas live together. Families who are similar, intergenerational contracts that are similar, marriage exchange amongst those who may be higher than us but belong to the same caste and religion become an important node of thinking through kinship. If kin are only those who are similar, then where do those who are different go? Do we only make kinship relations with those who are different based on ideas of fiction and friendship? Can those relations never be real? This is important in our understanding of how multi-species kinship can become part of a larger idiom of relatedness. 
Thus, animals, even though they are different from us, embody certain ideas of similarity, such as shared space and shared moments of affection and uh, ties that become important to thinking about kinship. In Govind Rajan's analysis of multi species kinship, then, it becomes important to think of how animals are themselves agential. Govind Rajan is very clear in her thinking that animals are also subjects of study. We only think of animals as oppositional to humans as th and as those who lack consciousness and thought. However, Govindarajan suggests that in her study, animals are treated as subjects who act and think just as humans do. This in itself is a revolutionary thought that requires further probing and analysis. We have to go back to our myths and fables where animals have particular agency and personhood. It is important to think of animals as those who inhabit our multiple worlds through our thought processes as well. Thus, if you remember as children, all sorts of stories that we may have learnt about invoke animals as people themselves who act and think through different modes of being. In that sense, Govinda Rajan is clear that animal stories are also stories that need important conversations. In her book on uh, the mountainous animals that she studies and their relationship with the humans who inhabit their space, Govinda Rajan speaks of how different sets of narratives bring together different elements of kinship and relatedness. In one of her chapters where she looks at monkeys who are displaced from the city and sent to the forests and the mountains, she finds that the monkey-human conflict is not at the center stage of the entire process. It is about how city monkeys are actually conflicting against the local monkeys in the mountainous areas. This is important to understand that multi-species kinship also involves newer dialogues into thinking about animal relationships. The man-animal conflict that we constantly talk about in terms of environmental protection and san wildlife sanctuaries is not just the way it has to be rendered. Man-animal conflict also emerges from animal-animal and man-man conflict. In moving towards an ecological and environmental mode of survival, we need to look at how animals relate to each other and to humans. Thus, in continuance with the ideas of how city monkeys are being displaced into uh, mountainous tracts and forests to protect city dwellers from their angry, aggressive behavior, Govindarajan finds that in reality, the local monkeys have daily fights with city monkeys for space and access to resources. Local Paharis uh, note, according to Govindarajan, that they feel closer to the city monkeys who have been displaced as they feel they too may be displaced by city dwellers as large tracts of forest, land and mountainous tracts are taken over by real estate developers. Hungry developers who take over the nature form a large conglomerate of this cultural overwhelming incursion into our natural ties culture in its behemoth and in its exploitative nature seeks to take over nature itself and render it useless. Climate change and other forms of uh, recent destruction to the environment point towards how the nature-culture divide does not work anymore. It creates further division and distance rather than acting as a unifying mode or emblem of understanding. Multi-species kinship is also a challenge to sociology and anthropology itself and to the idea of social determinism in thinking about how nature is also pose, nature also conceptualizes and poses a major threat to how we think about culture. Thus, in Govind Rajan's study, she finds that the sacrificial goat in, in the mountains who sacrificed during the annual festival of the goddess seeks to be sacrificed. This is an important intervention in looking, out, in looking at how animal rights is being positioned through the killing of ritualistic killing of animals in India. This is important also to think of how cultures mark themselves on animals and humans alike. Thus, in Govinda Rajan's study, she finds that Pahari goats seek to be sacrificed to the goddess as part of the culture of being Pahari. Here, outside goats may resist sacrifice, 
but the local court actually becomes part of becoming a, a member of a social construct which looks at being a resident of the mountains as being closer to heaven. Thus, living in Mukteshwar does not only mean being just a mere resident, but being a resident closer to God. According to Govindarajan, the extreme pressure against animal sacrifice that comes from other organizations within the area does not uh, includes not looking at the larger holistic idea of how societies enact particular codes of being. Such an analysis also extended in an interesting way into how stories are not just fictions of being and nothingness, but stories embodied live, uh, embody lived realities. The lived realities of the Pahadis includes their close connection to animals. In an interesting story about uh, a calf who refuses to leave a home battered by the floods in Uttarakhand, the, uh, the parable that is enacted by Govind Rajan is of this human animal love that can never be replicated. So while the calf refuses to leave the homestead, the owner of the calf also refuses to leave without her. Such a sense of relatedness comes only through shared ties of the forest, just like Anu Jalais finds in the case of the Sundarbans. In Govindarajan's study, the home and the hearth becomes an important space that both animals and humans share. Thus, the home with its stable and the lived apartments of the humans and the non-humans becomes very important to think of how multi-species kinship is enacted. In our earlier lectures, we have, we have discussed how the hearth is a space where the household comes together to make meaning out of what forms the joint family. Here in Pahari, amongst the Pahadis, the hearth is shared with animals too. Thus, people refuse to leave their homestead as long as their animals share it with them. In another poignant story of multi-species kinship, uh, Govind Rajan finds that the sale of a cow leads to extreme emotional disturbance amongst the other cows who inhabit the homestead and the barn. Ultimately, the owner of the cow has to bring back the cow after rescinding the sale to appease the other animals in the barn. Such deep linkages are not only limited to our popular imagination of talking animals or animated animal stories, but in reality mimic how we think of our pets and other animals. Thus, in in the leopard animal interface or in the interface where of elephants uh, walking into fields of cultivated uh, barley and barn is the idea of animals seeking to get in touch with humans as well. This form of desire does not only embody positive ideas. Uh, Govind Rajan is particularly particularly invested in looking at how kinship and relatedness is also a story of deep hatred and aversion. Animals are not always in touch with a sense of unity and love for their human uh, owners and relations. They also detest us and show it in seeming signals and languages that people who live close to animals understand. The human-non-human -human conflict becomes even more particular when certain animals are marked through particular political imaginaries. Govind Rajan is particularly interested in looking at how the recent movement towards identifying the cow in terms of a maternal idiom is problematic for looking at how local ideas of animals come through. In such divisive ideas of animals as exclusionary and inclusionary, our ideas of multi-species kinship which do not take into account people, places and their everyday lived realities. Thus, in looking at exclusions and inclusions within multi-species kinship, humans themselves may be rendered into animalistic categories. This is particularly important when one looks at colonial discourse of the native African or Indian who is almost likened to the animal. This kind of distaste and hatred towards the animal and to the inferior human becomes a part of political discourse and rhetoric there, which then excludes and deems this exclusion justificatory. In looking through these mirages and sense of uh, idealistic 
uh, notions of kinship, uh, Govinda Rajan pushes through the idea of how pahadiness includes both humans and animals in their particular sense of subjectivity. Thus, emotions, affect, feeling become important nodes of studying kinship. We must understand how emotion is an important node of looking at how we continuously make and unmake relate relatives. There is no particular tool to study emotions or affect as we found in our earlier lecture on care and kinship, but it is important to think through these categories to be able to understand how we can make multi-species kinship as a lived reality. In such a sense, her analysis of different forms of kinning with animals, whether it is the sacrificial goat, the city monkeys, the holy cow or the bear who elopes with a woman are stories of different forms of meaning making. This kind of meaning making according to Govind Rajan is not something that humans alone indulge in, but is something that is extended to other species as well. While respecting a new world where no one is different, equality ascertains the idea that we take into account species kinship with more seriousness. Thus, Govinda Rajan suggests that the idea of anthropomorphism is particularly important in looking through and analyzing anthropology in a new mode. Anthropomorphism, as she suggests, is the understanding hum of human like character characteristics that animals might possess and vice versa. We are all animals in our own sense just like animals are humans in many senses. Our animalistic nature is often relegated to the idea of something that culture must control. However, in such conceptualization, we enter into what uh, Govind Rajan suggests is anthropodenial or an envy that emerges from multi-species kinship. To overcome such envious uh, idealized, envious exclusion of multi-species kinship, we must go back to the drawing board and look at how humans embody animalistic spirits and how animals may also embody human-like characteristics. The more we look at our interactions with humans and animals, the more we tend to look at human-human interaction differently. In that sense, we must move towards a greater concentration of multi-species kinship to be able to overcome the disabilities of environmental degradation and crisis. On that note, I seek to finish multi-species kinship to finally bring back a summing up of the course that we have done so far. Our course on the introduction to family and kinship is an important note for you to think about not only ideas of anthropological uh, understanding, but also to think about how you would like to consider your intimate relationships. This course is not only meant to introduce you to anthropology and classical theory, but for you to think about yourself and your making of self too. Anthropology has within it the power to introduce people to newer engagements and ideas which can drastically change how we live our worlds. Thus, in this introduction to family and kinship to India, in India, the theory as you will see works together in a cultural conceptualization. We began with basic classical theory through the study of Levi Strauss and Radcliffe Brown to understand how marriage and blood are constructed within our everyday understanding of kin and kinship. While these categories may seem steadfast and strict, they are constantly broken down through newer engagements. We just discussed one particular new engagement known as multi-species kinship. Of essence in the contradiction between, in the opposition between blood and marriage is the idea of nature and culture. Nature and culture emerges from this de definitional separation which means that culture identifies nature, nature within particular codes of biological relatedness biological relatedness as we have discussed through Levi Strauss, Radcliffe Brown and others is dependent on the sexual procreation of social members. Thus, in the act of procreation itself, we see many and manifold social rules emerge. One of the most important social rules as discussed earlier is that of the incest taboo. The incest taboo makes it important for us to not indulge in intimate sexual relations with kin so that we may uh, extend our social relationships through the idea of exchange and marriage. 
The incest taboo is also linked to local cultural ideas of procreation where gendered elements are contribute different ideas of different sets of descent groups to members who may come into the earth. This notion of procreation therefore link, is linked intimately to marriage and the idea of procreation of, of, in, of incest. And in that sense marriage, incest and procreation ultimately lead to rules of marriage that are proscribed and preferential among certain groups of people across the world. Thus cousin marriage becomes an important rule by which different sets of people link with their kins without breaking the rule of the incest taboo. Cross cousin marriage as we saw is an important element in our understanding of South Indian or Dravidian kinship. This is also relevant in looking at how we think about kin and kinship in drastically different ideas. Thus while cross cousin marriage is an important rule among South Indians, in North India the idea of giving and receiving between hierarchically superior and inferior affiance becomes an important node to think through incest. Marriage and exchange therefore involve an element of economics which has to be hidden under ideas of gift giving and uh, euphemized through particular notions of giving and receiving. The notion of gift giving becomes an important node within the anthropology of kinship to look at how economics works. In order to eliminate the crass economics of money exchange, gift becomes an important theoretical tool to think of how relatives can never be equated with, sim with simple economic transactions. We never really exchange money with our relatives is the idea that we have constantly been talking about through, through the notion of exchange. Marriage in its elemental definition of exchange between kin excludes the crass economics of money transactions to include the more pristine pure idea of the gift of the virgin or kanyadana as it's seen in the as it's seen in the north indian context however this sense of euphemization does not always last as we go into the study of how joint family and household necessarily involves certain sense of economic transactions the identification of the joint household and family therefore includes sharing property and income in common when such categories are shared and get involved in people's rendition of the same, it becomes necessary to think through the economics of intimate kin and familial transactions. Most importantly, the, impo the introduction of a gendered study of kinship means that we look at particular ways in which the household and family can be exclusionary. The most important principle of exclusion works again through women when they become mere objects of exchange just like other forms of gifts. To also understand how a patriarchal and patrilineal structure excludes women and other members of the society, members of a kin group who may be inferior to the larger discourse, it becomes important to think about kinship as not only unifying but oppositional and in many cases uh, exploitative. The household may be even more exploitative as it channelizes the labor of some members while giving merit and credit to others. This is seen emotively in the way in which the household shares its food and serves food in particular ways to girl children or boy children or excludes other elderly members of society who have become redundant to the labor group. Thus family and kinship again and again is not the only positive sense of being that we continue to think of that we think of it in, in terms of our rendition of intimate relations but has larger implications for the way in which we think of our, uh, of our relations and relationships. In its conflictual, diachronic and di uh, divisive sense, family and kinship occupies certain ideas of ambivalence and ambiguous, ambiguity that run through our lectures on care and kinship on the introduction of technology and kinship and on the study of new and alternative forms of kinship and kin making. Thus gay and lesbian families occupy a particular idea that we seek to understand in more detail. Gay and lesbian families provide an oppositional discourse to the understanding of biology just like multi-species kinship does. However, as we see many times gay and lesbian 
families fall back into the demands of biology by seeking to procreate children through the use of particular technologies such as reproductive technologies. This form of uh, enactment and intrusion into the intimate sphere and into the idea of kinship itself becomes deeply problematic and needs to be constructed through particular paradigms which bring forth the conflict and ambivalence inherent to kinship systems. We are now interested in looking at how particularly excluded groups such as domestic servants, aging, parents seek to be part of an intimate circle that may exclude them through ideas of economic prosperity and necessity while at the same time constructing an overarching idiom of familial unity and togetherness. The study of kinship and family is extremely dynamic. We are now forging ahead into an area which seeks to understand how the whole construction of fictions and the narratives around fiction itself is a fictionalized rendition. Is our understanding of blood and biology a fiction itself? The study of multi-species kinship suggests that kinship in itself is a fiction. Going back to the way in which Snyder dismissed kinship in his work on the critique of kinship suggesting that the biological assumption of sexual procreation means that anthropology has rendered the study of family and kinship useless. Are we back to a moment where we seek to re-engage with kinship through a newer idioms at the same time rejecting the classical anthropological idioms that we have been using till now? Is, that, is it to say therefore that cross cousin marriage and the incest taboo will slowly become redundant in thinking about how we make relationships if we start making kin and not babies? If we follow through with Donna Haraway's uh, cry to coming to save the planet, we will not be left with any sense of procreation ideologies, but newer forms of engagement that look at how kinship can be made and unmade. On that note, wish you goodbye and hope that you enjoyed this course. Thank you.